Hi guys, welcome to Pointy Not Sharp. Today we're going to take a look at an Imperial German Zeitengewehr 98-05, more commonly known as the Butcher Blade. You'll note this one is one of the few that actually has a sawback as well. Now these bayonets were made for the Gewehr 98 as well as the uh, various carbines that Imperial Germany was using at the time, like the uh, Carabiner 98A and the uh, 98AZ. And um, a very large number of these bayonets were made during the First World War by pretty much all of the uh, bayonet blade manufacturers in Germany, primarily out of the town of uh, Zollingen, or Zollingen, which is like a uh, very, very famous uh, town for arms manufacture going back to the 1400s. A couple of other manufacturers outside of Zollingen also made them. And pre-World War I, a small number of these were made, but nowhere near as many as were made during the First World War. Jumping into the history of this bayonet here, uh, the Gewehr 98 was originally designed to take another bayonet, and that was the Zeitengewehr 98. Now, I've said Zeitengewehr a couple of times, that's essentially German for uh, sidearm, which is what the Germans call bayonets. Now, this is a very, very long and very, very fragile bayonet, and this was designed to be the, the primary bayonet for the Gewehr 98, and that's what the uh, infantry were equipped with. And the Imperial Germans did have a couple of different um, bayonets and initially they wanted something like a machete for their Pioneer Battalion. So they came up with the 98-02 for Pioneer Battalions. And that's very similar to what we have here, except it was significantly heavier. So the blade was a little bit longer, the blade was much thicker, uh, much taller, and it didn't narrow when it came into the crossguard. So Weight-wise, I think it weighed like an extra kilo or two. It was a very unwieldy uh, bayonet. And in 1905, I believe it was, they started trials into lightening it, and that's where they came up with what we have here. So in 1906, the 9805, which is this bayonet here, was introduced for Pioneer units only. And it should be noted that of the bayonets made in 1906 for Pioneer units, every single one of them had a sawback like this one here. Now this first generation of 9805s is uh, referred to as the Ultra Art or the older model. And they're a little bit different to what came later. So this is the, the newer model or the newer, newer art. And uh, this one comes with a steel scabbard. The original ones had a leather scabbard. They also had, uh, you'll see it's like a little impression here for the barrel. They had these like uh, semi muzzle rings, and we call them ears that came up either side, and they didn't have flash guards like this one here has. Then in uh, 1909, uh, this bayonet was doing pretty well. A lot of people liked it. It was very versatile. Uh, it made a good machete, it had a sawback, it was utilitarian. It wasn't great for fighting, in my opinion, but they hadn't figured that out yet just due to the weight. Uh, it's a little bit unwieldy, but um, again, that's my opinion. So in 1909, it was also issued to uh, railway units, field artillery, and uh, telegraph units. This uh, adoption in 1909 for those units was a model of this bayonet that did not have the sawback. So I believe 6% of all Imperial Germans had sawbacks, but it's unclear if that generation had 6% of them having sawbacks or not, but did uh, definitely the um, ones were made during the First World War did. Anyway, 1914, uh, war were declared, uh, both sides met, and uh, trench warfare very, very quickly uh, started and got horrible. And the Germans quickly realised that something this long and this fragile was not suited to trench warfare. It was very, very impractical. It was branch snapping, bending, and it was just unwieldy in confined spaces. So, in, uh, I think it was November, no, late 1914, it was decided that um, the 9805 would be the bayonet that they would move on with from there. And that's when they've adopted the uh, NA, the newer art or newer model of this bayonet, and that is what we have here. That is the World War I production. The older model is pre-World War I. So these were made from 1915 all the way through until uh, 1918 at the end of the war. And again, 6% uh, of these had the sawbacks like this one here, and that's what this one here is. Now, the newer models, 
As you can see, they removed the partial muzzle ring or the ears and they added the flash guard here. And the reason they added the flash guard is because um, while this bayonet was initially designed for the Bear 98 rifle, uh, which is a nice long rifle and pretend my finger is the barrel, the muzzle sits at the top of the handle or the spine of the blade. When they attach it to a carabiner or a carbine, your barrel's sitting down here. So when you fire, you get a flash. And they were finding that the flash, the concussion uh, and the heat was damaging the wooden grips. So that's why they added the flash guard. So these were usable with carabiners or carbides. And as previously stated, the new models also came with these steel scabbards just because leather was getting difficult to source during the war. Uh, these bayonets here, they were the topic of a lot of uh, British propaganda. So the British were really trying to uh, paint the Germans as uh, pretty nasty guys. So they were pointing out that uh, sawbacks inflicted you know, unnecessary wounds and that they were war crimes and all of this, which wasn't the fact. Uh, the British were actually using sawbacks at the same time on some of their old Martini Henry bayonets, so they didn't have a leg to stand on, but they made the argument anyway. And uh, they also stated that uh, this bayonet was uh, a butcher blade. It had the shape of what was then uh, a butcher's knife. And they were really trying to paint the German soldiers as butchers, uh, inhumane monsters and animals. And um, those two bits of propaganda were extremely effective. I mean, they, they're still floating around today. We still call these bayonets butcher blades today. And hell, I meet people all the time who try to tell me that Sawbacks are crimes against um, humanity <laughs> or war crimes. So yeah, that's uh, that's still floating around today. Anyway, um, at the end of the war, obviously Imperial Germany uh, lost and uh, there's a huge number of these bayonets and where they went after the war, I find pretty interesting. So Germany retained a small number. They retained, I think it was 100,000 arms uh, as per the Treaty of Versailles. And the ones that were retained by Germany are stamped on the cross guard with 1920 and there's really not many of those they're really hard to get so if you get one don't ever let it go and then a number were uh, sold or gifted to other countries uh, Poland introduced them as an official um, bayonet and Turkey received a very very large number as well and the ones that went to Turkey were actually shortened so they had the blades cut down to like six or eight inches, I can't remember the exact length. I've actually got a video on the Turkish ones, so check that out if you want. And the Turkish ones, generally they don't sell too much, so if you want to get your hands on something like this, but you don't want to fork out big money for it, um, you can spend, you know, 50 to to $100 to get a shortened Turkish one, and the handle feels fantastic, and you know, they're just as good, I like them. Anyway guys, we'll jump into the construction quickly. So as you can see, we have a machete style of blade, um, very, very thick and heavy uh, at one end and very narrow at the other. Uh, we've got our sawback, which has diagonal teeth. If I can get that on camera, probably not. And then <clears throat> we've also got a circular fuller on either side of the blade. Uh, we don't have a sharpened false edge and we have a sharpened true edge running down the length of the blade. Then we have our cross guard, which is nice and thick and solid with a quillen facing rearwards. Then we've got our grip panels made of wood and we have a clearance hole here. If you're not familiar with clearance holes, they're essentially uh, when you mount one of these to a Mauser rifle, the Mauser rifle has a cleaning rod under the barrel and there is a hole at the end of the mortise that the cleaning rod slides into and it goes all the way to the end. The clearance hole is to push out debris that gets packed in there by the cleaning rod so you can still fit it to the rifle. And then we've got uh, two screws retaining the grips. The grips have these little serrations in them either side. And then we have, which is what's well, really a bit of an unnecessarily complicated um, pommel. I imagine that would have been a bit more difficult to manufacture than just a simple straight cut one, which they introduced later on different bayonets. Uh, then we've got a TO style of mortise. So, the T at the top takes the bayonet lug and the O at the bottom there takes the cleaning rod. And it's all retained by a ramped um, lug on a push button. Moving down to the scabbard, just a steel scabbard, nothing too fancy, ball finale. Uh, we've got a very German style of uh, frog stud. 
uh, leather frog here. And you'll notice we've got a bit of material here. I imagine this is originally from a trottle or a sword knot kind of thing that um, would have hung from this bayonet. And the mouth here is retained by a single screw. And as you can see, the blade only goes in one way. So that's the construction of the blade. Finally, we'll jump into the markings. So these were made by a lot of different manufacturers and the manufacturer's details are printed on the Ricasso. So this one here is made by uh, Waffen Fabric Mauser in uh, Obendorf. Pretty common manufacturer for these. Uh, I think there's like five or six really common ones and there's a whole bunch of less common ones. And there's a whole bunch of people out there who collect these and want to get every manufacturer and every year of manufacture. And some of them are really quite expensive, but I've never been terribly interested in that aspect of collecting. Then we have uh, property marks here on the spine. So, We've got the W for uh, Kaiser Wilhelm, and 16 was the year that it was accepted into service. And then we also have our inspection marks. So we've got one just there above the press button. And we have one down here on the ball for now. Now, some of these steel scabbards have manufacturer's marks on the back as well, on the, the steel. I can't get this one out of the frog. The frog's pretty stiff and I don't want to damage it and risk it. But from what I've, I've been able to tell, uh, Wolfen Fabric uh, Mauser, Obendorf, did print their manufacturer details on these scabbards, so it probably does have that. And the early versions of these bayonets, the Alta Art, or the uh, the first versions, pre-World War One, they were also marked with unit markings on the cross guard. Now, I've explained in previous uh, videos how to read the, the uh, unit markings and... It's pretty easy to find online if you have a look, but essentially it's like um, the regiment number, the type of regiment, the company number, then the rifle number. That's usually upside down, so facing that way. And the different numbers and letters uh, have different sizes depending on their importance. So your regiment number will be your biggest in company and then your rifle. That's really all there is to say about these. Um, they're very, very popular. A lot of people love to collect them and they sell for a lot of money for that reason. Particularly the sawbacks. Anytime you add a sawback to a German bayonet, you double the price. So um, this one belongs to a friend. He bought it for like 650 Australian dollars and he'd probably sell it for more than that now if he tried to sell it. But uh, yeah, that's all I really have to say about these. I've put this video off for a little while just because um, I don't know a terrible lot about 9805s and I know there's a lot of experts out there and I wanted to do it justice. I didn't want to half ass it, so I think I've found most of the relevant information. Anyway guys, if I've made any mistakes or left anything out, please feel free to comment below and thanks for watching.